All right, take your Bibles, please, and turn to Deuteronomy. Turn to Deuteronomy. We're going to be in chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. The title of the message, Brother Colton, is Watch Out for the Wild Beasts. Watch out for the wild beasts. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let's all stand as we read verses 7 and 8 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Good to see everybody this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, The Lord did not set His love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Brother Bobby, lead us in prayer, please. Amen. You may be seated. The promises that God has given us, it's truly amazing how good He is to a people like us. I understand these uh, particular words are written towards the people of Israel. I understand that. But gladly, we've been grafted in among them. If we're saved, the Bible teaches we've been grafted in among them. In other words, by adoption, uh, we're made the children of God because He adopted us through His Son. And because He did that, we're now child of the King. Now, please understand this. Not everybody are children of God. A lot of folks, ah, we're all children. We're not all children of God. We're children of God by our belief, our faith in Christ Jesus. If you don't believe in him, you are none of his. That's what the Bible teaches. So this promise then handed down, this promise that God gave, he says he's going to make us a powerful nation, not because of the strength or the amount of people that they particularly had, because they were the fewest of all those people, uh, but because of his son, because of what he wanted to do, because of the promise uh, that was made to their fathers, he was going to make us a great and mighty nation. Now, please understand this. I know we're not Israel. I know that we're Americans. I understand all those things, but the promises to us word are the same throughout the scripture as they are to all of them. So God has given us a wonderful, wonderful opportunity uh, to be a powerful people. Sadly, Christians mistake uh, uh, the worldliness today and the power that the world has gained Christians mistake that as saying we should just go ahead and exist in this world today, not be heard from, let's just go ahead and be content with what we have. But that's not what the Lord has given us. The Lord has given us a great inheritance. It's waiting for us. And we as Christians should understand that we can claim what is ours. God has given us that power. God has given us that promise. He promised the nation of Israel, you're going to go in, I'm going to take care of the enemies. I've said this many times from this pulpit. Please understand, the Lord's already given us the victory. However, you cannot get the victory unless you show up on the battlefield. There's never been one place in time where nobody came and the war was won, not once. Throughout all of Scripture, you see battles. And I, I, I'm sure that in Sunday school class, you talked about Gideon and the ridiculous weapons he brought to the battle. Ridiculous to bring a pitcher with a lamp and a trumpet. Dumbest thing ever, right? But because he showed up, because he did what God asked him to do, he did not need to have a bow. He did not need to have arrows. He didn't even need to have a club or a jackknife. He showed up with a pitcher, and they ended up busting that, by the way. But because God was there, the victory was theirs. Too often we rely on ourselves to win these victories. Too often we cannot wait to go in, even if it's guns ablazing for a good reason, but don't bring God with us. <laughs> the example of Ai is pretty good. 
Joshua, don't worry about it, man. There's just a few of them down there, buddy. We go down and take them. Rest easy. Everything will be fine. But you know who didn't go with them? God didn't go with them. They ended up running for their lives from the little place called Ai. Now understand this, very seldom will you see a Christian lose a battle unless they don't bring God with them. You bring God with them, he's undefeated. Now when you're talking about these things, you're talking about how can we become successful as Christians? How can we become successful as people of God, children of God? How can we become successful as a church? Believe, me, believe it or not, with the, all of the sickness going on, I was thrilled that our choir loft was still full. With all the sickness going on, I'm thrilled that we have a pretty good crowd today with all of the sickness. I'm pretty excited that we've got a decent crowd of children over at Super Church. God has given us great successes. By the way, may I also submit to you, in the midst of the worldliness that is infiltrating churches all across America, I'm glad to say that an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, blood-born-again, Baptist church, King James only, still has a full house. I don't need to have a little bouncing ball up on the screen. I don't need to have a, a coffee house out in the foyer. I don't need to have drum sets and guitars in the corners to have people come. Do you know why you're here today? Because of him. Not interested in entertainment. You're interested in hearing about him. Let's open up that Bible preacher, talk about him. That's why I want to do what I want to do. And that's why God gives us great success. Why do you think the jail ministry had so many people saved? Because Brother Coolidge took God with him. Apparently, Miss Josel took a bigger God with her, but bless God, he took, <laughs> amen. But understand this, at the end of the day, we're making a difference in Portage County. God gives us the promise that'll get that done. By the way, God doesn't send us with just a promise. God sends us with power. You can go through all of this and take a look at it, but please understand this. We're going to win this battle for this nativity. So we're going to win it. Why? Because God gives us his power to do it. It's got nothing to do with you and me. It's all about him. All we got to do is show up. It's amazing that our little church, and, and, and you think I'm joking, our little church is all over the place right now. Oh, Christmas is over. It'll stop. Oh, no, it won't. This is going to be all year long if it needs to be. Preacher, why do you care so much? Because of him. What did he do for us? God's given us his promise. God's given us his power. But more than that, God's given us his presence. Man alive, do you think he wasn't there when our bulldog, Miss Phyllis, was out there saying, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Forcing people to have a good time. Bless God, if you're not going to smile when you go by, I'm going to make you smile. She's in newspapers all across the country because of her insanity. I'm going to tell you, I had great joy out there standing with Christians, singing about the Lord Jesus Christ and unashamedly shouting, Merry Christmas. The signs that my daughter made are literally in newspapers everywhere. And it makes no sense, right? When God's in it, that's when it becomes great. So God's in it. His presence goes with us when we go. And by the way, I'm not even talking about the nativity scene now. I'm talking about the general success of us in our community. And I want you to understand this now, and I want you to hear it well. We need to be more of a voice in Ravenna, Ohio, not less. We need to be more of a voice in Portage County, not less. They, they shouldn't have been introduced to us this last Christmas. They should have known us well. Well, now they do. And guess what? I want them to keep knowing us well. Now, please understand, as with, as the Lord says, I'm going to go with you. Uh, the Lord says, I'm going to do all these great things. Uh, and then I want you to, but I want you to understand this. This is what's interesting. God gave them his promise. God gave them his power. God gave them his presence. And then God says, wait, I want you to look at this verse with me. I, I, turn over to uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 19. And the great, temp the great temptations which thine eyes saw, and the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the stretched out arm, whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out of Egypt, by the way, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't afraid at all when we went down there. But, but please, wait a minute. But there were some that were. 
let me help you a little bit. When you go to do something for the Lord, there's going to be people that are against it. <laughs> they don't like him. It's got nothing to do with you. Don't take offense. They're offended at him, not you. Oh, you may be called names, idiot. I'm called names, idiot, by people that love me, let alone people that are my enemies. <laughs> I promptly remind them it's pastor idiot, please. But understand this. They're, they're going to call. By the way, can I help you a little bit? People are brave behind a keyboard. Oh, I'm going to get on you a little bit now. Listen, I know social media is a real big hoop de hoo I, I understand that. Twitter, Facebook, big deal. Everybody's into it, got their own pages. Praise God. But it's amazing what they'll say on that. But they won't come tell me. I double dog diggly ding dong dare you to come and tell me. You're not showing me bravery. You're showing me Wizard of Oz mentality. I'm going to tell you from behind the curtain, but I won't come out and show you who I really am. Had a fellow say, bless God, I'm going to bring my big dog down there the next time you guys protest. I w if I'd have been online, I would have said, good, I'm going to bring a box of milk bones. Because Jesus loves your dog and so does Bethel Baptist Church. Listen to me. We are not suffering persecution when we go out and talk about the Lord. We're not. No. Don't compare yourself to the people in the Bible. Don't act like, oh, my goodness, we're such martyrs for the Lord. We're not martyrs. We should have been doing this a long time ago. But please understand, God gave us the power. God gave us his presence. God gave us even a little spark of ornery. But we've got to do something to be successful in our community. They should know who you are. They should know you're a Christian. Why are we ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why are we having a hard time telling people uh, about our loving Savior that loves you very much? Why are we having such a hard time? Well, bless God, at the workplace, it's not allowed. Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't want you to do anything against work. I don't. Don't do anything against work. Your boss tells you to shut it down. Bless God, shut it down. But don't you ever tell me not to be a Christian. Don't you ever tell me, oh, preacher, you need to not be Christian. You need to get somewhere else to go. Because I'm going to be Christian whether you like it or not. Look what this says. The great temptations which thine eyes saw and the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand and the stretched out arm whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. We don't need to be afraid. Jesus Christ goes before us. Moreover, the Lord thy God will send the hornet among them. I, must, I might be him. The hornet. Can you imagine all these enemies? I, I, when you read the Bible, crack up a little bit. It's okay. You don't have to sit here and go, holy, holy, holy. I see the hornet. I start laughing. Can you imagine all those big guys out there carrying shields and spears and Swords and out there, king, 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 come on, come on, Israel, come on. And then all of a sudden, zzz, zzz. <laughs> tell me that's not what happened. The hornet moves in. What's your sword going to do now? What's your shield going to do against all the stupid bees? What'd the hornet do? It drove them out. And, and let me explain something. It's not just hornets. These are hornets from God. Probably very capable stingers. Probably capable of stinging more than a few times. Could you imagine? You study the Bible, armor is always on the front, but there's nothing on the back. Could you imagine your back getting all stung up, running away from the Israelites, and the Israelites just going... <laughs> The hornet among them until they that are left and hide themselves from thee. Now who's afraid? Be destroyed. Look at verse 21. 
Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God is among you. He goes with us. A mighty God and terrible, not terrible bad, but terrible frightening. And the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. Now, wait a minute. They went to the promised land, and remember, they didn't go in. They sent out the 12, two, the 12 spies, and Brother Lester Roloff always said, and that was 10 too many. The 10 came back crying, oh, <laughs> we can't do it. Joshua, Caleb stood up and stilled the people. Caleb likened them to breakfast. We'll eat him his biscuits. Wait a minute now. Those two were aware of the promises of God. The ten were afraid that they'd never win. That's more people against than four. And it turned Moses' heart, and they wandered 40 years. Now, 40 years they wandered. Now, they come back into the promised land, and the Lord says, wait. Think about that for a moment. They wandered for 40 years, and now they come in, and God says, don't go so fast. There's got to be something to this. There's got to be something that God's trying to teach us in our Christian lives that will help us. Everything I talk about anymore, I run through the litmus test of flesh and spirit. Everything I do because it's amazing that this battle, in my opinion, is the most prevalent battle a Christian will face in their life. And it's not the battle out there. It's the battle in here. No, no, you look at me and you listen to me well. It's not about the nativity scene. It's about somebody with enough dander in here to go out there and stand. You had to overcome the flesh in 20 degree weather. The article that I read this morning, I might add, uh, cracked me up because it said, uh, Christians went out and protested 20 degrees. And then in parentheses said, that's negative six Celsius. I don't know why I thought that was funny. I thought that was funny. Bless God, they even brought uh, the metric system in on it. But anyhow, so we were out there because something inside of us overcame the flesh. It said, I'm just going to stay home. By the way, if you stayed home, I'm not against you. Just please understand this. We stood out there for a reason. It wasn't out there just to show off. It wasn't out there just to say, hey, bless God, we're just doing something stupid to let everybody know. Oh, no. There's an end game here that must be recognized. And as we start to have success in the community and start to have this success in what we do, and by the way, a biblical precept is going to be taught here. Everything must be done decently and in order, but Jesus teaches something here that I believe will help every one of our lives not only to succeed, but also to be able to handle success. Now, wait a minute. I want you to see something because God already gave them his promise. Amen. God already gave them his power. God's already given them his presence. Then God says, hold on a second. I'm also going to give you some parameters. Now, what, do, what do you mean parameters? Well, can I ask you a question? Jail ministry, successful this last year. What a, what a great example. I'm so happy that that folder's been on my pulpit at the right time every time. That's a success. Ladies, success. Wonderful success. Don't change a thing. Oh, wait, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> this is the word of God. King James Bible, unashamed, unashamed to tell you, unapologetically, this is the only word of God for the English-speaking people. If they decide we've had so much success, if we would give them a version they could read easier, we'd be more successful. Wait a minute. That's outside of God's parameters. It's outside of God's parameters to pass out daily bread as opposed to the Bible. 
not opposed to daily bread, but I'm more for the Bible than I am for the daily bread. I want them when they go in and sing songs with the people to sing hymns. Why? It's worked in the past. Little by little, we've gotten in there. Little by little, we've had success. And I don't want it to go to our heads. I'll get with you here in a minute on what this means. But you must understand something. Success, when you have success as a Christian, have success as a church, which in my opinion, we are highly successful in Ravenna, Ohio, at being a good, independent, fundamental, blood-washed, born-again, Baptist church. We're highly successful. You can use that success at times, though, and God says, look, I gave you my promise. Amen? I've given you my power. Yes, he has. I've given you my presence. If you don't think God's here, I feel bad for you. Because God's here. He's been with us. He was with us when we was freezing. Do you remember the kid? I don't know where she came from. Pulled up in the middle of us sitting there. She pulls up with hot chocolates. That's a stranger. Bringing us hot chocolate of which I didn't get any. Not sure who was responsible for that. But then God says, yes, I've given you this, this success. Yes, I've given you uh, 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 this notoriety. Yes, I've given you. I've been with you. I've been with you. And you know I've been with you. But wait now, I'm not going to give you everything at once. If you think we're done right here, this is not as big as Bethel's going to get. It's not. We need to act like it. Amen. Now, wait a second. I want you to see what happens. The Lord says this, and the Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little. Thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. Wait. The Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee and, and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. But remember, the verse before says, but not all at once. I thought about this. You study a little bit, you'll find out that the beasts back then were not just deer running around. I'm not afraid of deer. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see one once in a while out in the woods with a gun. I'd love to see that. I've never seen... Deer just seem to do this to me when I don't have one. They run right out in front of me, big horns and everything. <laughs> but uh, when I have a gun in my hand, they, they don't show up. And I'm sure it's my fault, but I don't know how. Don't go hunting with me. I'm the deer jinx, just to remind everybody. But at the end of the day, the beasts that you study about, there were lions over there and bears. There were uh, vicious uh, uh, creatures over there that could harm people. And, and if you look at this just a little bit, God says leave some of the enemies there because they're going to hold back these beasts from, from your life. You say, well, you're not making much sense. Can, can I bring it to a spiritual thought here? What are some of the beasts that quick success could take over in our lives? What are some of the things that having quick success, and by the way, I, it's amazing, I've seen it. I wonder if pride could be a beast with great success. Hmm. Pride goeth before destruction. A lot of folks say pride goeth before a fall, but that's not what the Bible says. Pride goeth before destruction. A haughty spirit goeth before a fall. And if you see some, I believe personally that pride is probably responsible for over 90% of all the sinning we do. What do you mean, preacher? Well, you either feel you're above it, too good for it, doesn't affect you, or you don't care, all of which are pride issues. We look at this and we say, well, what do you mean pride? Let me ask you a question. Let's say the Lord gave us Ravenna in one day. Everybody in the whole Ravenna, oh, let's, let's just go big. Let's say Portage County. He's given us the promise. He's given us his power and his presence. Let's just go ahead and take all of Portage County at one time. Wouldn't that be grand? And it would. It'd be wonderful to see all those people saved. 
How long do you think it would be before we would start to fill with pride? Look at what we've done. Now, hold on a second. Jail ministry. Oh, my goodness, what a great thing. I don't want Brother Coolidge or any of the folks that work in the jail ministry to say, look at what we've done. Now, please understand, it's very good that you show up. And because you show up, you do deserve a thank you. Because showing up matters. But don't forget, it was the promise of God, the power of God, the presence of God that saw those folks get saved. Amen. Don't forget, that's why I very seldom, I, I very seldom talk about somebody winning somebody to the Lord. We all ought to be soul winners. Every last one of us ought to be a soul winner. Very seldom do I talk about that. Why? Hey, listen, I don't care if Brother Jarrett wins 10 to the Lord tomorrow. It's the Lord that did the winning. Yeah. Jarrett showed up. And I'm glad of that because not very many people show up to go soul winning. But understand, just because this young man shows up to go soul winning does not mean he won the soul. God won the soul. God's the one that died. God's the one that was in the grave. God's the one that rose again. And if this young man gets too full of pride over how many people he went, oh, that's terrible. You'd never say that. I've seen more people than you can imagine. Can't wait to tell folks how many people they won to the Lord and they never even went out one time. What happens? Pride set in. Pride set in. I want it to be more about me than I want it to be about the Lord. Can you imagine if the Lord gave Israel everything that they ever could have conquered right in one minute? Israel might have stood there and pounded their chests and said, bless God, look at me. It wasn't Israel that rained brimstone and fire down on Egypt. It wasn't Israel that uh, killed the firstborn. It wasn't Egypt that brought, or it wasn't Israel that brought in locusts. It wasn't Moses that did all those things. It was God that had the mighty hand that brought them out. I remember the fellow that led me to Christ. I'm glad he showed up on the battlefield that day. But it was God that saved me. And we must understand, I think, one of the things that can happen in our life is we get too full of ourselves. We get to a point where we say, bless God, this church would not survive without me. Listen, Brother Jordan is doing a fantastic, I mean, how many words could I say about the job he's doing in choir? But it's because of God's promise, because of his power, because of his presence, that our little church is successful. Brother Jordan is not the first choir director to ever come through this place. He's not the first one that's been successful. But if we allow ourselves to say, bless God, this choir goes nowhere without me. Do you see the wild beast come in? Do you see the animal come in when Brother Coolidge says, this jail ministry is nothing without me? He might be general of the army, but buddy, God's the one that's the leader. I'll take it a very, very good step further. I, I'm your man of God. God's put me here. There's no doubt about that. I know it. But let me explain something to you. If God takes me out of here, there'll be another fellow that'll come right behind me and be just fine. It's not about the person. It's about the God of the person. Amen. Why are we successful here? We're successful because we've got God's promise. We're successful because we've got his power. And bless God, we've got his presence. Well, bless God, uh, uh, that, that, that pride come in and that pride took a church down. And I've seen pride take more people down than you can ever imagine. Not only that, how about a profane attitude? One that's taking God's glory upon himself. Let's say God does something great. Well, Brother Coolidge could have said, hey, preacher, guess what? I did a great job in the jail ministry. I was responsible for all these people getting saved. This goes beyond pride. This takes pride to a whole new level. This pride says, I'm going to take the credit that God, is, that God should get, and I'm going to put it on myself. There was a king in the Bible that did the same thing. He stood in front of the people. Man, when he spoke, everybody thought he was wonderful. They looked at him and said, man, that must be the voice of God. 
That king stood up there and said, it really is. <laughs> Next thing you know, <laughs> God didn't like that, just to let you know. He's eaten by worms. One of my favorite super church stories. Could you imagine? See, that's another one of those moments that you look at the Bible and start to chuckle. Can you imagine standing in front? Yes, to I be the glory, great things I have done. That was funny, by the way. And all of a sudden, worms, and he's gone. That's the, that's the noise worms make when they eat. You've never heard that? <laughs> so bless God, he comes in with an attitude. He takes pride to a new level and gets this attitude where, bless God, I'm getting the glory. It's me that's doing this and not God. That's a frightening place to be. How about your personality can be corrupted when you have quick success? Pretty soon you're signing autographs more than you're reading your Bible. Pretty soon you think whatever you say is so important that if people aren't listening to it, then they are so very wrong. You get to a point where, bless God, your way is the only right way. Got news for you. Your way is never the only right way. God's way is the only right way. I get a little sick and tired of, uh, of these, and, I, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against going to another man and listening to another man. I, I'm pretty good friends with a couple of preachers, but bless God, they go away from this book. I'm not following them. And I don't care who they are, by the way. I don't care. I love Dr. Fugit, but brother, I'm going to tell you, if he brings the NIV up into the pulpit, you're coming home. And I'll go and get him. I'm going to tell you, I'll, go, I'll be speeding down there. And Tim and Joe Sell probably be in front of me. I was going to say behind me, but they'd probably be in front of me. And I'm going to tell you, I'm bringing, why? I'm not going to allow a man to take God's place and to do God's things. It's, it's God and God alone. You get to this point, like, well, bless God, I'm so important. I'm so good. I'm, let's say our church runs 5,000. Let's go ahead and say that. You think we can't? Well, where do you think these churches started out? Same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Hey, we got people here too. So let's say that happens. Does that make us a better church than anybody else? Help me. Does that mean God is blessing here more than anywhere else? No. Listen, God wants us to do what he wants us to do but he's trying to tell us there's parameters if i give you too much at once you might heap this onto yourself if i give you too much at once you might get pride if i give you too much at once good lord lord they've been gone and wandering for 40 years don't you think it's about time you let them have what you promised them yes i do but it's going to be my way my time you think well preacher boy it's been so long remember we had the building thing was 2000 AD. Preacher, that's 18 years. Why don't we have a building out there yet? Good Lord, we're working to get a building here. Little by little. Hey, listen. When something happens, and this is what, remember I just preached the message, don't get used to how good it is here. It wasn't too long ago that if I was to stand right here, I'd be standing in a hole. Don't you remember that? He gave us what? He gave us a platform. Wait a minute. That's just a small thing, preacher. Come on. Boy, the choir had a whole lot of room to work for the cantata. Hey, wait a minute. Our guys didn't have to show up and put together a two-by-four platform over here and block off our door to the restrooms upstairs. Wait a minute, I know that's just a small thing, but bless God, he gave it to us in his time, his way. And you look back and say, bless God, boy, that, that is nice. I sure am glad the lake is drained. <laughs> and if your uncle or grandpa put that up there, God bless him. It just was time to go. God gave it to us. God gave us the foyer. God's going to give us the, uh, uh, the, the canopy out front. But we must realize it's in God's time, yeah. in God's way, in his parameters. 
And if he gives it to us too soon, we might let the wild beast come in. We certainly don't want that. Your perspective can be altered. And I, I'm going to end with this one. <clears throat> you know what's most important? And, and, and we need to understand it. Please, if you're going to listen to anything, listen now. We cannot let our perspective of what we're doing be altered. What do you mean, preacher? <clears throat> There's only one thing that is important to a church. Every single thing revolves around it. I don't care what it is. Everything revolves around this one thing. What is that, preacher? It's telling people about Christ. Everything. Well, what do you mean the cantata? <laughs> 15 people got saved at the cantata. What was the most important thing? It wasn't to have a grand production, although it was. It wasn't to have great music, although it was. It wasn't to have a great soloist and a great drama and a great group of people. And they all looked nice. It wasn't about that. Although it was all of those things, it was about the 15. Why do we run a youth program? Why? We want to see kids get saved. Why do we have buses? Because we want to see kids get saved. Why do we have a youth leader? Because we want to see kids get saved. Why do we have a jailman? Because we want to see kids get saved. Why do we have a sound system and we want to put it all over the internet? Oh boy, whoo, you think it's going to be bad? <clears throat> Wait till we live stream. Wait till we, because I'm not sure that I can hold myself in We might want to have a deacon's meeting about live streaming. What's it all about? It's all about people getting saved. Why do we do what we do? Why did you bring in Christmas gifts? To see people get saved. Why do we paint the building? To make it look nicer so people will stay, so people will help people get saved. If it's not about that, see what happens is if we get too big too fast, if we get too successful too fast, we could change our perspective and it could be, well, bless God, I think what we need to do is, is do everything uh, out there. Let's buy a brand new car. Well, listen, if I'm going to buy a vehicle, I want people in it to come and get saved. Well, bless God, let's build a gym. If we have a gym, I want to bring people to it to get saved. I don't want to just get a gym so we can toss a ball around. Listen, when we have basketball, we're, we play every once in a while out there in uh, Wyndham. What's on my mind is who can I get saved? Colton brought a good buddy of his from work. Guess what happened? <laughs> I told him about the Lord the first day. Why? Everything we do should point to that. If we have too much success, we lose our perspective. And we start to say, you know, it's more important to get rid of the mustard pews and have really nice pews than it is to get people saved. I got news for you. I'm glad people are sitting in the ugly mustard pews. You are Christians like Browns fans. <laughs> Steadfast and sure. You're going to sit in mustard pews. Bless God, you must be godly. Wait a minute, I'm not interested in the remodel unless the remodel has souls in mind. Yes. Yes. We cannot lose our perspective. Why do we do what we do? We do what we do to see people get saved from every aspect. From buying a baby grand piano, which we're, I'm looking for one right now. We had money donated towards it. I love this old piano. But I'm going to tell you, I'd love to have a baby grand piano. Why? So it would be more impressive so people could come and people could get saved. What, what, well, see, there's that impressive thing again, preacher. This is God's house. Why should not this be the greatest? Right. Yes. Amen. But not because of the house being great. Because the God of the house is great. Yes. But we must keep it in perspective. We must do it God's way. We must be in his parameters. I don't want, listen to me, and you, listen to me well. I've been preaching for 25 years. I'm not going to change now. 
I'm, I don't, 25 years from now, I hope I'm still preaching behind a different pulpit. But I hope I'm preaching still. And I hope the message is the same. I hope it stays in perspective. What's the perspective, preacher? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Every year it seems like I wax nostalgic and I don't know why around this time of year I seem to think about the past and the pictures and I see the pictures of your families when they were younger and you stick around a church for a while and you get pictures that you can't believe that was you. I'm, I mean, I am twice the man I used to be. I'm telling you that with all of my heart. And, and you look at some of these pictures and say, bless God, man, I remember when. I remember, and some of you might remember this we talked about the Mount Salem Revival Grounds. We went there one time and we will not go again. Not that it wasn't a good place, but we all got sick. I mean, my wife and I, I, I my wife got sick. She's throwing up everywhere. We had kids with us. Uh, uh, Becky was there. She's throwing up everywhere. My brother-in-law was there. He was throwing up. He was all kids throwing up everywhere. Brother Dan Sabo. It cracks me up to try to remember this stuff. We had to ride down with a different church because we didn't have a vehicle. I'm not kidding. We didn't have a vehicle that could make that trip. We went down riding with somebody else. Preacher was there. He called Dan Sabo and said, hey, brother Dan, can you get a vehicle? Come get us. We're all throwing up. Ah, youth memories. <laughs> Brother Dan buzzes down in a borrowed van from New Testament church. Why? Because we didn't have one. Little by little. Precept upon precept, line upon line. That's what the Bible teaches. Think about it now. Take your pick of vehicle. Think about it. We've got a bus ministry where before we had bus says. And we ran them. But Larry Brummett was running buses before most of you were born. And what you have is a church that has grown to what we are because of the great promises of him. And yes, it's only been a little at a time. And yes, it's only been a few things at a time. But throughout all of those things, the perspective was kept that it must be souls. As we think about this, and I'm almost done. God says, go in. God says, conquer. God says, I'll drive them out from before you. God says, I'll do all these things. But then God says, but you're going to do it my way. And you're not going to do it any other way but mine, or it's going to be the wrong way. I don't ever want to do it the wrong way. I believe we're going to be, we're already tremendous. But I believe what God has in store for us is bigger than we can ever imagine. But it's going to be his way, his parameters. I don't want the wild beast to come into Bethel Baptist Church. Amen? Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this message. Oh, God, thank you so much. Lord, please help. We need you. No doubt about that. Without you, what are we? Lord, we need your help desperately. Lord, we want to do it the right way, your way. That's the only way that's right is yours. So, Lord, please help us to stay that way. Help us to keep pride out of our life. Help us to realize everything we do for you is because of you. In our flesh dwelleth no good thing. We all know that. But, Lord, that power that you give us through your spirit, Lord, it's supposed to be aimed at one thing, and that's souls for you. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that is to be with this great church. And Lord, I've just thought about this throughout the years, all the great things you have done through this little ministry. Lord, I believe one day it's going to be much more substantial than it is. But Lord, honestly, it's so great now because of the greatness of you. Lord, don't let us ever forget that. Don't let us ever forget how great you truly are. We thank you for everything you you've already done we thank you for everything you're doing and we thank you for what you're going to do we love you and we sure do thank you for loving us we pray this in jesus name amen